Hello and welcome to the Centre for Countering Digital Hate and what was a coalition with Channel 4's discussion about the ways in which dangerous misinformation about vaccines is spreading and how we can stop it. Unfortunately, I'll say from the off that Flora, the documentary maker of the fabulous documentary, The Anti-Vax Conspiracy, has had a bit of a family emergency, so I will be stepping into her position on the panel, but we still have a fantastic lineup for you today. Now, I'm Rachel Riley. I'm very pleased to be here in my position as patron for Centre for Counter Digital Hate to be able to introduce this hugely important and topical issue. Now, I'm no stranger to being bombarded with misinformation and online conspiracy theories through my work, uh, my experiences speaking out against the rise in anti Semitism in recent years. And it's through this cause that I first became involved with the CCDH almost two and a half years ago. Its founder, Imram Ahmed, and his team proved to be a vital lifeline in this fight, not only with their practical methods for fighting online extremists by targeting their abilities to use social media to monetize their hate, but also with CCDH's advice on how to combat their messaging without inadvertently helping it to spread, and how to keep your mental health as intact as possible in doing so. The great thing about the CCDH is not just their expertise, but also their non-partisan approach to tackling dangerous extremism from wherever in the political spectrum it propagates, and their wider understanding of the many sorts of social issues that are currently eroding society that form part of the same problem. It's all to do with an online attack against truth, evidence and decency and the use of the internet and social media in particular by hate mongers and charlatans to profit from such decay. Now, due to speaking out against anti-Semitism on social media, I've been accused of being paid by a foreign agent. I've been called evil compared to the Nazis. I've had violent and threatening messages, including wishing my then unborn daughter to be born stillborn. In posting about getting my Pfizer vaccine, I've been accused of being paid 70,000 pounds for doing so having lied about actually getting the jab in the first place. I've been called satanic evil. And as a pregnant and breastfeeding mother, I've been told I'm responsible for the imminent death of my unborn child and that I sh my children should be taken away for child abuse. These problems are two sides of the same coin and they need urgent attention to curb this growing phenomenon, especially as online misinformation is able to spread at a rate that makes the transmission of COVID-19 itself look pedestrian. From the get-go, CCDH have been extremely aware of the dangers that anti-vax conspiracy theorists pose, undermining public confidence in evidence and science, often for their own enrichment and with huge real-world consequences, including putting lives at risk, and when it comes to vaccines, particularly the lives of children. As soon as COVID-19 struck, CCDH were instantly aware and mobilised against the threat that online misinformation and conspiracy theories pose, knowing the damage they could cause to the global fight against coronavirus, and shifted their focus to tackling what they knew would be a critical battle. I hope many, if not all of you, have seen that incredible Channel 4 Dispatches documentary, The Anti-Vax Conspiracy, which the documentary makers did an incredible job of exposing the kinds of dangerous conspiracy theories and unevidenced nonsense which is being spread regarding vaccines and COVID-19 in a way that left no room for any sensible person to have absorbed any of the scaremongering in evidence, whilst also leaving them in no doubt as to the sway that these people and their ideas can have on a proportion of the general public. Um, I, I, as I say, I was gonna, about to be introducing that, that documentary maker, Flora, to you now, but unfortunately she's not able to be here, but we still do have fa two fantastic panel members. Um, we today are joined by Noreen Khan, the founder and lead program director of NISI, a Bradford-based organization supporting single mothers. Uh, NISI's COVID lead program, which Noreen set up during the pandemic, trains young people to challenge the myths around COVID-19 and vaccines in their local community. Um, and I know she specifically works with the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities who have seen um, more than most, they've been targeted with misinformation. So thank you very much for joining us, Noreen. Um, and our other panelists today is the aforementioned Imran Ahmed, CEO of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, member of the government's Counter Disinformation Forum, and also part of the Pilot Task Force Steering Committee for the Commission for Countering Extremism. Um, as already alluded to, the CCDH studies and actively tackles the use of digital spaces to spread hate and misinformation, and they've been actively disrupting the anti-vax industry over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and to keep our panellists in check and direct the line of inquisition, we have a wonderfully qualified chair for this discussion, Dr. Philippa Whitford, 
MP. Dr Whitford was first elected to Parliament in 2015 as the member for Central Ayrshire. She served for three years as the SNP spokesperson on health and social care in Parliament and is now the party's parliamentary spokesperson for Europe. And prior to her career in politics, Dr Whitford uh, worked as a surgeon and she is also, she also serves as the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on vaccinations for all, which I know she's going to give us some more information about later on. Um, so I'm, I'm about to pass over to Dr Whitford to invite each panellist, except myself, to speak for a few minutes um, and then she'll be asking some questions, at which point the discussion will be opened up to anyone that's here, so please do get your questions in. Um, whenever you have them, just pop them in the chat and I know um, Dr Whitford will be happy to put those to the panel later on. So without further ado, I leave you in the capable hands of Dr Philippa Whitford. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you for introducing our um, panellists. Um, I would just say to people who are attending, it's not actually the chat you'll put your questions into, but there is a specific Q&A part. And if you type them in as you hear something, as you think of it, don't wait till the end. But there will be a short time when I'm asking both Imran and Noreen some questions to give you some time to think about it. Um, I'm actually not just the Europe spokesperson for my sins. I'm actually still six years on the health and social care spokesperson at Westminster for the SNP. So you can imagine between Brexit and COVID, I've had a fairly busy year or so over the last 14 months. But as chair of the uh, all party group on vaccinations for all, we recently published a report on how we drive uptake of vaccines. We started that inquiry back in 2019 in response to the fact that the UK lost their elimination certification for measles. I hope many of you did watch the incredibly powerful documentary that Flora made. I actually found it quite painful watching. And in 2019, 207,000 people died of measles across the world. And that is an extraordinary number. And it touches on the WHO describe uptake as driven by three key themes, whether you have complacency about the disease you're trying to deal with. And one of the problems we have is indeed complacency. Young parents haven't seen polio. We think of measles as something trivial. I think one of the things we have seen regarding COVID vaccination is that particularly older people have not been complacent about it. But we may see that emerge among younger people, and we certainly are seeing it in particular groups, even before you get to those who are vehemently against vaccines. The next is confidence, and that's the main theme of this afternoon. How do you stop misinformation and deliberate disinformation from putting people off? And the third one is convenience. Take the vaccine to people. Um, because that way you're helping to lower some of the other barriers. But as um, the WHO said at the start of this, the danger isn't COVID, it's the infodemic around it. The people who deny its existence, the people who deny the public health measures we need, and particularly those who are undermining our key positive response that started at the beginning of this year which is vaccination. And that obviously is our main theme for this afternoon. So I'm going to come to you first, Imran, if you can talk for about five minutes on the work that you're doing and the particular themes that you want to pull out for our discussion. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Whitford, um, Philippa. Um, we- uh, this is fine, <laughs> Imran. Just, let's keep it simple, Philip is fine. Um, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate was set up uh, four, four and a half years ago in response to a series of challenges in British politics, which it became clear that online misinformation and hate and their spread, their untrammeled spread, was contributing to, to, to real social problems that w were occurring in the offline world. And in February 2020, uh, when COVID hit, it was clear that misinformation uh, and in fact identity-based hate would be critical components to the problems that we face as a society um, of dealing with both the pandemic of COVID, the biological pandemic, but also this parallel social pandemic of misinformation, of vaccine hesitancy. 
that would actually exacerbate the biological pandemic. And we've been working on it since then, but even before then, actually working with the APPG on a report in December 2019, which gave us a baseline to know that actually in COVID, it really has. I mean, as I say in the movie, it's been Christmas for them. We've seen a massive expansion of the of the scale and sophistication of an industry whose job it is. And this is always extraordinary for people to think about. There is a, an industry out there whose job it is to tell people that, that, that doctors are liars, that what they say is untrue. And that science cannot prove why disease, that there is no scientific explanation for disease. It's caused by something something different it's not caused by what we have concluded um, so we uh, as an organization were set up initially to look at digital hate uh, as, as, as is clear to sort of anyone that's been with us for a long time um, but disinformation uses the same architecture it's very often the same actors it's definitely the same platforms being used and it was actually the same culture that the CCDH was set up to, to counter of allowing the, un, the, the, the sort of the un, unmitigated flow of bad information, whether it's hate or scientific misinformation, with impunity. And we were set up to create consequences for uh, the spread of misinformation, the production of misinformation. So what are the findings that we've found over the last year and a half and some of the things that have come out in the documentary? Well, first of all, it is really clear that a, that a very small number of people with economic intent with who are economically motivated have been able to spread a vast amount of disinformation, which has has in some cases really, really damaged. Uh, in fact, I mean, I'm speaking to you from the United States right now, from the state of Georgia, uh, which uh, has a serious vaccine hesitancy problem. And it's actually crippled the effort to contain coronavirus. So misinformation has actually had a real consequence. And we've been studying uh, the way in which memes have spread, but more importantly, the themes that underpin those memes. And the themes are really simple. It's not about microchips. It's about three things. COVID isn't dangerous, vaccines are dangerous, and you can't trust doctors. And those themes have been co-opted, not just by economically motivated anti-vaxxers, which is brilliantly brought out in the documentary, but we've also seen they were co-opted by the people that were there on January the 6th in, 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 the, uh, in the capital. Um, we've seen it now being used to, we see vaccine disinformation being pumped into, for example, 2022 target areas. This is a growing phenomenon. And it's one that, it's not one that we're, we're looking backwards to and saying, well, what happened in 2021, 2020? This is one about, this is actually uh, uh, something that we will continue to have to deal with and that we haven't yet put the tools into place to deal with, whether it's the online safety bill or it's having uh, law enforcement take a really serious attitude towards those people who seek to fraudulently economically profit from misinformation. So, I mean, I hope that some of these themes will come out in the questions that we have today. I mean, as uh, as Rachel said, I, I I've been a member of the government's counter disinformation task, uh, policy forum running out of DCMS, but we've also worked with DHSC and Home Office on these issues um i'm very keen to uh to encourage further both cross-party cooperation but also cross-departmental cooperation on trying to contain this problem which you know this documentary is a fantastic snapshot of where it is now my fear still is that in two three four years time that this problem will actually grow uh, further thanks so much That's lovely. Thank you very much, Iman. If I can come to you, Noreen, and we'll hear from you and then we'll have a bit of a chat, uh, the three of us, and also bring Rachel back in for some discussion and then come to our audience. Over to you, Noreen. Thank you very much, Philippa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so as Rachel uh, kindly introduced at the beginning, my name is Noreen Khan. I run an organisation in Bradford that we've been running for just over five years now, predominantly looking um, and supporting single mothers and women with children. And we differentiate this by means of, you know, a, a single mother independently or a woman with a child who may be in a married situation um, and there are different dynamics happening within the household. This enables us to really, really hit the grassroots um, inner city communities at a fast pace. 
And where this came into use for us, particularly for today's session, is with regards to COVID. So back in March 2020, um, when the schools suddenly shut down and the predominant area of the way we engage with uh, inner city community mothers is by way of parental engagement programs through the schools. All of a sudden, we didn't have access to this, which meant how do we start to connect? Was it just telephone calls um, or did we try to get them online? Um, there was many dynamics that we started to learn um, about communities at a much faster pace, such as digital poverty, such as other frustrations. And then we saw a complete spiral um, in um, a, a complete increase rather in um, domestic abuse referrals. And these were different dynamics that were coming out in these referrals to us of trying to seek refuge um, for um, mothers fleeing um, such situations. And these dynamics were specifically down to the breakdown of communication, understanding and, and um, knowledge and trust in COVID the virus. Um, so this started to break down family units now as well. So whilst we are all about reassurance, progress, development and upskilling these families, we suddenly saw frameworks of families falling um, by the wayside. It was then that we started and, and the board and my colleagues started to look at dynamics and, and ways of trying to introduce and, and reintegrate with these inner city communities that had fallen apart uh, and, and not believing the COVID um, uh, virus itself as well. It was with thanks to the foresight to the chairwoman of NISI, who by the late summer started to realize if we've got such an epidemic going on with people, a lack of um, a trust in the virus itself, who weren't staying at home, no hands, face mask, etc. Um, then what would this mean if and when a vaccine did ever come? So with this foresight, we then applied um, for an independent fund from Power to Change, who, who uh, gratefully funded our idea to create a lead leadership program. We've been running uh, lead leadership programs for over half a decade now. And one specifically that we knew that we wanted to mobilize was specific to COVID. We re resonated with uh, BME um, families specifically because we realized that that's where the disproportionate figures were coming from. And in doing so, our USP was to work with young people in universities studying so, uh, health and social care specifically, so they were already within that medical field, to upskill them with the intelligence and knowledge necessary to be able to um, uh, put them into the communities and have COVID conversations within the city communities, the ones that they could connect with um, and really resonate with as well. So this program, not only the, the, the dynamic of the knowledge and the upskilling, it also included the leadership qualification. So we knew that we had powerful and skilled people on the ground. And what was very unique as well was that we used these COVID public advocates that were upskilled, that have been upskilled, to produce a policy paper. A policy paper that was uh, presented to the vaccine minister, Nadeem Zahawi, um, back in March. And what this meant was that this was a very solutions focused um, uh, uh, program. Um, it wasn't just about the problems happening in the communities, which I'm sure we'll go into, into detail slightly later with Philip and, and Imran, but in terms of on the ground issues, it wasn't just the problem there. We had solutions as well for it, which we are still hoping will be taken into consideration going forward. And lastly, the, the, the uh, programme also includes a leadership summit, um, which will is yet to take place but because of the lockdowns, etc. Um, but we have been uh, offered the opportunity um, by some ministers in London to meet with these COVID public advocates um, and discuss the policy papers more so. Now, what, uh, in, in terms of the entire programme, we've seen an astounding response um, with well over 1,200 people that the 20 COVID public advocates alone have managed to turn from either an anti-vax or vaccine hesitant person to actually being inoculated today. Um, and, you know, that's an average of eight people per day that they did during their programme time. Now, when we're in a city such as Bradford, which is the ninth most deprived city in the UK, a population of over 530,000 uh, people, we have unemployment rates of 11 percent, 13 percent of which have no qualification whatsoever. Um, so when we start to look at what these dynamics are of the inner city communities and where some of these misconceptions, uh, these myths could be stemming from, we really had to understand and listen to these communities. These inner city communities are not dumb. So we took the stance of that we are, you could say, on their side. 
but by educating and nurturing and working with them, we were then able to gain a trust with ourselves as a grassroots organization at a quicker lightning speed other than what a policy or authority um, uh, people were able to do because we became the trusted force. And in doing so, we were able to then um, you know, support and, and save families uh, more so. But then now that leaves us with being that bridge for, for the community. And we now have to work very, very fast and at a higher level to get our voice heard or be that central body for the inner city communities to the powers that be to try and bridge that gap of disproportionality that we are living with day in, day out. That's causing the frustrations and ultimately, they're not actually anti-vaccine, they're probably just anti-establishment because of years of slavery and Islamophobia and racism. All of these factors have meant that very, very entrenched communities have actually just become you know, neglected for 30 years. Um, and these frustrations are now coming to the forefront. And this is how we've successfully been able to turn that tide by understanding this, um, th these issues um, and working with them. So I hope that helps give a bit of a background and then open up to further conversation. Thank you, Philippa. Thanks very much, uh, Noreen. Just in some of the questions, I, I'm going to start with you. In, in our report, and my thanks to the team for putting the link in the chat, um, it was very much, as I said, something that started pre-COVID, uh, although obviously massively expanded. Um, but the thing very much came out, exactly the point you were making about listening, you know, particularly if it's a, an ethnic community or a religious community, official bodies can just make a presumption that it's something cultural or religious. When, you know, particularly one of the studies we had with the Haredi Jewish community, it still boiled down to quite a lot of practical issues. And so I, that was very much one of the messages that came out of our report is you need to engage with the community and listen to why people are not. So can I ask you, what, what is the main drivers that you're finding among the black and Asian community um, as to specifically why they are either against all vaccines or, you know, unwilling to take the COVID vaccine? Is it the same kind of stuff that we hear all the time or do you think some of it is more specific? So I certainly don't think it's with regards to all vaccines, because if we look at the you know history of this from all ethnicities, vaccines uptake has been very, very positive. Yes, you've always got this, you know, a bit of misconception for, for small uh, communities, but on the whole, it's been very positive and it's never been questioned before, Philippa. What we've seen um, in, in this COVID is that there's now a counter narrative available, whereas previously with vaccines, counter narrative was never there. So whether it have been the Ebola, whether it have been you know any of the other viruses in the past it was just a given the intelligence was there but there was also a very straight and honest um delivery um of the information to the masses unfortunately a lot of the communities now or those who are skeptical now has been because of this um the mixed messaging philippa that that's been coming out um and also the the very kind of hypocritical messaging also so the first reactions for example and and every example i give may i also declare that this is an assessment of findings this is not my opinion this is not noreen's version this is an account of what our findings have have brought about so when they talked about over crowding in inner city BAME communities being a huge issue uh, and being the super spreader of different variants. Well, you know, what we were hearing was that Prince Philip had COVID, um, Prince William had COVID, Prime Minister had COVID. They do not live in overcrowded high rise flats. So when they're trying to look at what these messages are coming out and how it's not relevant to these communities, that the irrelevance of it was causing further um, frustration. When we look at why BAMES are disproportionate in the first place, I mean, let's look at those intentional social housing structures, you know, the way they're pulled together in certain areas, there's integration issues, um, you know, then you're looking at the poor health, you know, whether it be consanguous marriages, when they're all placed in one area, and they don't have those social mobility factors to enable them out to, to other areas, this is again, where the same wrong information starts to breed. And wrong information breeding 
at a very, very early stage means more and more generations will follow through with that. So I certainly think it's now because, and the internet as well, Philippa, that's played a huge, huge part in this um, counter narrative and also the, the spread of misinformation. Um, and what it's also taught us is that where previously with vaccines or general information coming from public health or government was a very top down approach. What we've seen now is that it's a bottoms up um, approach because it comes from social media. People are putting out their own things. You know, some examples of previous, you know, misconceptions and, and myths that were being created. I mean, I could easily call myself a doctor and, and put up a page and wear a white coat and say, these are the facts of this. I mean, there was a, a video that came out from America last summer talking about the vaccine packaging, some doctor, somebody. I mean, the vaccine wasn't even created or founded by then. And suddenly there was this vaccine packaging that's got, you know, goodness knows what in it. Um, so things like that, we, we really, whilst we rely on the internet, it's also something that we really, really have to look at carefully, because one thing guaranteed for sure is any community and every community has access to information via the internet now. If I could just ask you, Rachel, obviously, you've got a big following on social media. And clearly, you know, you you've been a kind of a, an ambassador for the Centre for countering digital hate, and I'm sure get quite a lot of interaction because of that. You know, how easy do you think it would be to to kind of deal with the problem on social media? You know, there's been a change, more social media platforms are putting up fact checking, are redirecting people, you know, how as someone who's not a doctor not in this all the time, what's your experience that you think what they could do? I think what the social media platforms are, are saying they're going to do and what they're actually doing are two very different things. Um, for example, you know, they, they say they'll take down COVID and misinformation, but if you go on Twitter and you try to report some COVID misinformation, there's no specific function for that. You can go online and you can report abusive behaviour, you can report racist behaviour, but you can't report COVID misinformation. So, I mean, that, that, that's one issue. Um, I know that from the CCDH's report that they found um, on Instagram, um, when people are susceptible or, or follow um, follow anti-vaxxers or you know anti-vax conspiracists, even with information that's tagged by this particular platform as misinformation, they will still push it and they will not only push that, but they'll do the crossover. So if you're more likely to be interested in anti-vax conspiracies, you might be interested in anti-Semitic conspiracies and they'll push that as well. And they'll, that, I mean, it's, it's worth money for them. So in, in my opinion, with these social media companies, every time they say they're tackling whatever social problem it is, you know, they have the capabilities to take down copyright material within two hours or within a couple of hours. I've, I've reported some photos myself that they have no authority to, to, to have on their platform and they take them down instantly. They don't take down this stuff because there's no incentive, there's no legislation backing it up, there's no financial um, implications and until we have financial implications, until they're um, you know, they're either made publishers or their they're, they're liability is actually at their door, they won't do anything because it's it's worth millions upon millions upon millions, um, if not billions. I mean, I, I know Imran knows the, the figures of, of, of the money it's worth and until it's going to hit them there, they're going to do all the PR they want to make people think that they're acting when they actually don't. Do you think that if we made the public more aware of how all of this is monetized to be literally more than a billion dollars a year, you know, that people might be more skeptical of it? You know, we're, we're quite skeptical of someone trying to flog us something. And maybe if people realize more, they're trying to be flogged a piece of misinformation. Do you think that would help to undermine the, the faith people have, Rachel? Inside. Yeah, I, I think so. I think more transparency in um, in in where you know they're getting money. I think the, one of the, the great great things about the documentary was um, someone who was suing one of the social media companies for for being taken off the platform actually explicitly said how much money they would be losing in revenue by having this this you know outlet to speak to so many people taken away. And I think as soon as people hear the money behind it, they're maybe oh they're not altruistic. Oh, the person that came up with the the autism scandal also patented. Um, the single use vaccines at the same time he was undermining, you know, as, as soon as you see the bigger picture, um, I think I think just just transparency, um, I think like Noreen saying transparency information being upfront with people um, leads you to make better decisions. It's when you it's when there's that grain of doubt, it's when there's some secrecy, when there's a, um, a report that's been made that's not out there, what's in it, that's when the conspiracies start. So I think, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, that was very striking in the film, the monetization. And as you say, the, I can't remember his name, but the, the guy who got pushed off Facebook, in, in his case, he didn't mention anything like sharing information or anything altruistic at all. It was literally all of his costs. Imran, obviously a lot of your work is around the anti-vaccine misinformation and particularly on social media. I mean, how easy do you think it is for companies to, to deal with the problem? And are you hopeful regarding the UK government's online safety bill? Do you think that's going to be a, a game changer in tackling misinformation and disinformation? Um, I, I think that the, the tools that we have available right now for dealing with this kind of problem are, are very poor from a government perspective. And it's really been civil society that's had to drive forward um, the you know, awareness and, and the changes that have happened in social media policy over the last two years. So let's start, let's, I mean, let's start at the beginning. In June 2020, CCDH released a report saying, uh, you think COVID disinformation is bad, just wait till the anti-vaxxers get hold of it. So this is before a vaccine had even been, uh, we, we, we knew that the Pfizer vaccine was coming or had been had shown success uh, in phase one trials. We, we'd warned that COVID disinformation was pretty ragtag. There was a lot of far right actors pushing it. There was a lot of anti-government people pushing it. It was a bit of a mess, but it was sort of 5G conspiracy theories. But the real experts in monetizing and creating sustainable businesses for the spreading of misinformation were the anti-vaxxers. That, uh, that, uh, the point of that report, Nick, Mark Zuckerberg was asked about anti-vax misinformation. He said, it's fine on my platform. Like, that's not against our community standards. Come uh, October or so, in October 2020, when the vaccine is, is kind of deep into production, the World Bank is buying, is spending, is investing billions of pounds into buying uh, vaccines for COVAX. At that point, um, the... Uh, we caught the anti-vaxxers basically plotting over three days how they were going to take advantage of the of the COVID opportunity for them, because this was a great big marketing opportunity for them. I mean, if you think that, you know, general distrust or even specific community distrust of government or of doctors or whatever else is the flammable material and anti-vax misinformation is the petrol, well, then COVID was the spark, right? And it, and it set off a wildfire. Um, and they knew that. They knew that there was a big opportunity there. At that point, we rushed out a report based on recording those three days of their discussions called the Anti-Vax Playbook, which explained what are the key themes and how they're going to do it. How are they going to manipulate social media algorithms? At that point, still, the social media platforms weren't changing. It was only when that report was picked up in particular by Congress and the Senate in the US and Mark Zuckerberg was asked directly about it that he started to change position. And by the beginning of this year, the platform said, anti-vax misinformation, we think is disgusting it needs to be off our platform so here's how we test whether or not they've done it there's three ways first of all we go and we we, we actually report misinformation to them and then we go back and check if they've taken any action on reports fewer than one in 20 bits of misinformation in our first investigation and around one in 10 for our second investigation bits of misinformation even when reported to them. So forget about algorithms or the complexity of finding this needle in the haystack. This is when we literally say, there's the needle. They don't take action. The second way of looking at whether or not they've done enough is to look at the key super spreaders. And we've identified the key super spreaders in reports like, Panda, uh, like the disinformation dozen. The disinformation dozen, 12 attorneys general wrote them saying you need to take these 12 super spreaders of misinformation who produce 65% of the malignant content off your platforms. Four members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee asked Mark Zuckerberg about it personally on, based on our report. Three members of the Senate wrote with a copy of our report saying, what are you going to do about it? Since then, those 12 still have their platforms. They've taken 29 of their 89 social media accounts down and reduced their, their audiences by 40%. And I'm very proud that CCDH managed to get that done. But still, that leaves 60% up. And, you know, I'm, I'm an Asian kid, so 40% uh, is never good enough for my parents. I need to get to 100 um, on these super spreaders. So it's really, you know, it, th 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 their action has been piecemeal. They haven't even enforced their own community standards. The question for me is what tools will the government have to ensure that they do live by their community standards because community standards aren't just the rules imposed on us they're the expectations 
that we have of what we of, of when we send our kids into those spaces of when we enter those spaces are we going to be deluged with predictable from predictable sources disinformation that might cause us to to, to, to come to harm so I mean, all in all, is the online safety bill gonna do it? Well, I bloody well hope so, because it is our best chance. And I think actually the online safety bill is some of the most advanced legislation in the world on this. The question is whether or not parliament's gonna promulgate it in its current form, and also whether or not other things will be added on to make it more effective. Like for example, disrupting the advertising market, the online advertising market, which is a critical component. And I won't go to, into it in detail here, in how bad actors fund their services. And um, so obviously you were looking in the film at, you know, the biggest driver. So do you think this commercial return is very much the main motivation and driver of the big players? I mean, obviously there will be individuals have got all sorts of motivations, but in general, do you think money is at the root of it? Of anti-vax, yes, I think they're economically motivated um, actors. And I mean, you know, it's interesting because you, you, I always say that people profit from online misinformation or hate in three different ways. There's political um, profiting, there's, there's economic profiting, and there's psychological profit. And some people are just built to want to cause chaos, and that's negative social potency. So trolls, for example, um, you see a high prevalence of negative social potency. They're profiting from it psychologically. Some people are profiting from it politically or in terms of power. And you see that, for example, with the far right, or you see it with other malignant movements that we look at. With the, with the anti-vaxxers, they're in it for the, for the dollars. Uh, Noreen, if I can come back to you, um, the young people that you work uh, with who are, are obviously discussing with people in their community about um, vaccine and, and COVID on a daily basis, what do they come back to you with as the best way of dealing with misinformation or concerns or misconceptions, whether about the pandemic itself or the vaccines for it? Excellent, thank you. Um, so th what they found, they actually very organically created their own way. They found their way by having those COVID community conversations, whether this was online and this was at a time where we then went back into online, but within their own networks, they were able to have those face-to-face -face conversations. And it really was about listening to them and hearing what their version and their simplified narrative of it was and responding in a similar manner. Now, I will give you one very quirky analogy that came out from one COVID public advocate Philippa which I thought was genius so um, a, a family inner city Bradford of um, Pakistani heritage um, very limited English bar this one child who was going to school so on that basis, um, the family was uh, very much um, hesitant, um, didn't understand. And their quorum for one of these misconceptions or myths was, how has the vaccine been produced at such a fast speed? Um, when, you know, usually it takes 10, 12, 15 years. And what this one specific COVID public advocate came out with was the analogy of, bear with me here, of when you go to a restaurant and you order a curry. Stick with me, trust me on this one. So if you were to go to a restaurant and you order a Jalfrezi or a Dopiaz or whatever you go for, the base, the curry sauce is already made and it just gets tweaked to whatever, you know, taste your, your version is that you want and then they'll add their bits on that. And he said by having his intellectual knowledge that he had gained from healthcare professionals um, during his upskilling sessions, he said it's the same principle for a vaccine. These scientists are working around the clock and they've been working around the clock for decades. The scientists creating vaccines is nothing new. Baselines are already there, but dependent on the variant and what comes forward is how that they started to create the formula that has now worked and we've seen go global now. And that analogy seemed to resonate so well, and it went out like wildfire that people started to understand that A, this was an emergency, it was a global emergency, and all financial resources were pulled together to create this vaccine. So this simplified information that resonated and was relevant to the cultural background, to the understanding and the narrative level of the community that was dealing with, this is what they found as their USP, Philippa. And it worked at all levels. These, the advantage of working with these university students was that they have access to their peers in universities. 
so that was one cohort. They had access to their families, of course, and their friends and cousins outside, but also that we were able to upskill them through the leadership qualification with the abilities and skills necessary to engage with different age bands as well. So dealing with the older populations, and then based on the questions that they were asking and trying to dispel those myths in a very, you could say in a very jovial um, way, there, there was a lot of jesting around, but sometimes you need that formula because see, on a serious note, Philippa, communities have been told to for a very long time. They've been told when to stand, when to sit, what to do, where to go, how to do it. And it's come to a point where because where that disregard had come from government doing something else to the communities being told to do something, it wasn't in sync, Philippa. And that um, non-sync that was going on was meaning anything they now said, they were going to do the opposite. So we had to intervene very quickly. And that is what the COVID public advocates did. And they did it so well. Uh, obviously, the examples of hypocrisy that we had uh, towards the end of the first wave or in this last week obviously haven't exactly helped with the do as I say and not do as I do. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, you know the wealthy, the prime minister, others getting infected. I mean I do remember um, the complacency uh, that was in the House of Commons last spring. Um, my annoyance as a medic at seeing the elbow bumping uh, that is used I don't know what aspect of that is thought to be two meters. Um, but I wonder whether we're discussing this more because we're looking at it. You know, yes, um, some people have recognized there are particular communities with relatively low vaccine uptake. But I wonder whether COVID has actually made governments pay attention in a way that they simply haven't paid attention before. OK, um, thanks very much. Now we're coming to some of the audience questions. Um, the first one, obviously, there's a lot about Wakefield, Andrew Wakefield and the MMR vaccine, uh, which drove the, um, the outbreak in 2019, but obviously drove huge measles outbreaks and very poor uptake, drove England right down to 80% uptake, well below kind of community protection levels. For MMR back in 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 2000. Um, so this questioner is asking, you know, why are so many people susceptible? You can understand that someone with an autistic child blames it because autism emerges um, roughly at the time when children have completed their vaccination and they were simply vulnerable to that story. But why are so many people? I wonder if we come to you, Rachel, just because of your your kind of broader social view, if you like, or social media view, you know, it's not just parents of autistic children that are vulnerable to this. It's huge. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I kind of approach this from my math background um, and I from having conversations, obviously, because I'm, I'm vocal about this subject and I, I work with CCDH, so I'm aware of the problems. Um, and for me, the, the there's no analysis of, 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 of relative risk. So it's an understanding of statistics and understanding of probability and understanding of how science works. Um, so how one piece, you know, for example, the, the pregnancy issue, um, when I first became pregnant, um, there was, you know, that we we're being advised not to have the vaccine and it's, and it's understanding why that advice was in place and understanding that we didn't have the data. We don't approve things without the data. And then because America has a different policy, we, we got enough data and we were allowed to approve it. And it, and, I, and I, I, the thing I hear most often is, well, I don't want to take the risk, but there's no, there's no um, you know, connection with the relative risk. Not taking a vaccine does not leave you with zero risk. It leaves you with a risk of, of, of getting that, um, of catching whatever disease you would have been vaccinated against. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, we just need more transparency. We just need more simple, like, like Noreen said, simple explanations of science. I think the BBC have, been, have done a good job of, of um, tackling, you know, some of these conspiracy theories without spreading the information. Um, but I, I just think that, you know, a, a fundamental understanding of risk of statistics of probability of, and of how the scientific process works would help a lot of people because there's a lot of people who are educated um, but who have seen you know medicine move move on over the years and who have seen mistakes in, in medicine so and, and you should be skeptical absolutely you should ask questions you should get the right information but it's being able to take that information and understand it and process it um, which I think we're lacking really. Do you think that sometimes you know there was almost just a mantra as if no vaccine could ever have a side effect 
and therefore why are you questioning? I mean, you know, I don't like that we use the term vaccine hesitancy in a negative way to describe, mm -hmm. if you like, the eight or 10 percent of people in the UK who, who might not just turn up for that first appointment. In actual fact, there's only about two percent of people who will finally refuse. Mm -hmm. So the people in between are just people who want to ask some questions. It, it, you know, I'm a surgeon. I wouldn't think of asking a patient to sign the consent form without going through every dot and comma and crossing every T. Um, you know, so we, obviously we had the issue of the uh, cerebral sinuses uh, thrombosis. Now the number is tiny and as you as a mathematician, we can explain that. But there was a little phase at the beginning where almost there was, a, there can't possibly be side effects. Whereas actually, if you are open with there, you know, there is X per million risk of this happening from the vaccine, there's actually 40 times that risk of it happening from COVID. Absolutely. And here are all the other risks. And so maybe it's openness that we need. I, I, think, I think openness and, and, and data, access to data. I, I remember when um, when it was announced, you know, AstraZeneca, there's the, there were fears about blood clots with AstraZeneca and, and, and grave, grave, you know, some, some there were sm a small number of, of grave cases. And then from social media, because I follow scientists and I follow, you know, people who are giving me the right information, I, I saw um, a relative risk based on age. So the age that you, you know, the, the risk that you would have from not getting the vaccine versus the risk that you have from getting the vaccine change dependent on age and dependent on um, what what are the the coronavirus was at the stage, you know, how, how, how prevalent it was in society. And it's unfortunate, that's the only place I saw that information and it was so useful. And that for me as a, as a scientist, you know, with a, with a you know, a, a skeptical brain, but someone who, who trusts the science. And um, that's the information that I needed to be able to say, well, well, this is why I would still recommend it. And you can look at your your risk profile based on your age and what's happening in your community. Um, but unfortunately, like I say, that was the only place I saw it. So I, I think one of the CCDH is the key thing that they do is not just to not spread bad information, but to actively promote good information. Um, so I think that's one of the messages that we can get out there. And I think, I you know, Noreen's organisation are, are doing that in space. I, I think that is really key. I mean, I think all of us on the call are, are aware that if you just go in and try to myth bust, you, you often end up that you're, you're amplifying it. We had an issue here in Scotland um, where our care home staff were being targeted uh, aggressively with misinformation. Uh, that was causing issues. Now, we got slated a lot because our general public uptake was, uh, or delivery was slow at the beginning because we put all of our effort initially into care homes and care home staff. Care home staff were vaccinated at the same time as the residents and our um, head of the NHS, our chief medical officer, our deputy, they ran three nationwide webinars for care home staff, just on a turn up and ask any question you like. And we've got well over 99% uptake of vaccine in care home staff. And yet in England, at about 83%, they're talking about making it mandatory. You know, mandatory solves nothing. To me, it actually goes in, in the wrong direction. So I think a lot of it is, comes back to what Noreen was talking about. Listen to what it is someone is concerned about and try and answer that. Um, if, if I could come to you, Nori, now, we've got a couple of questions, you know, what's the best way of tackling it? And particularly someone who's got an anti-vaccine family, you know, how do you do that with people you love and will be living with, as opposed to someone you chat to and then you go away? So how, how do you tackle that among your close connections? Absolutely brilliant question and, and certainly one of the most relevant um, that it was, especially for the COVID public advocates that we were working with. Um, and the purpose, the, the reason they applied for the programme was very personal to them, that they knew that there was a family member that too was sceptic. Um, so the, the way that they did that was by upskilling themselves first of all, made sure that you've got the right facts and figures to hand. And then really get to the point and try and, don't just dispel by saying, well, because the science says this. Not everyone is clinically minded. I know for sure I'm certainly not, Philippa. Um, what we do have is a communities background, very grassroots, able to connect with communities that we know people have not been able to, neither authority nor policymakers for decades. But it's because if you're able to really understand why they're having that, talk further with them, see below the, the issue of what it is that's in the forefront, there's usually something, whether that be a bad experience from, from a previous inoculation, was it that there was 
was an unfair treatment given somewhere? Did a loved one pass away once, which wasn't actually related to it, but you recall it as being related? There are numerous reasons why people um, have these concerns. And just like you've previously previously said, Philippa, sometimes you're not going to change people at all. There is a set belief system, and that too is okay. Some people you're never going to change, and that's fine. Which is why we say about 80 or 85 percent margin has to be inoculated in order to gain that that mass immunity. So. Taking that into consideration, if there are the fact that they're willing to have the conversation and listen to you about facts and figures about the virus or, or the, the vaccine, you're almost you pass first base. And it's about continuing that, but with love, care and interest, not how it's been previously put on us in the past. And I think that's the key thing about that is, is understanding, um, you know, empowering with knowledge. There are legitimate concerns and they do need answering. It's unfortunate that we've not had these concerns answered at a faster pace from the, the, the powers that be and little organizations like ourselves has, has to pick up that tab. But we've done it, we've done it effectively on a shoestring. And then that, that brings a whole different topic about what you know powers are, are doing in during this time. Um, but I certainly say empower with knowledge, but you can only do that when you're empowered yourself. I mean, I think what you highlight is the fact that it it has to be an ongoing conversation. You know, even if someone is willing to talk to you, you know, you can't pin their ears back for half an hour and just blast them with information. I mean, it is often dropping one pebble in the pond and they think about that. And then, you know, you have a further conversation and, and, and you're kind of building up uh, either a, a uh, an acceptance of vaccines or at least an openness to, to kind of read and, and learn a little bit more. So how do you think the more official bodies, whether it's local NHS or GP surgeries or Public Health England, or where, how, can, how can you get them to come into communities in the same detail as... I, yeah, I, th I think public sectors really lack relationship building, Philippa, with other sectors. Surface level contacts will only go so far, but they don't get to the depths of the issue. And I think this is where we've seen that real gap um, in connecting with um, inner city communities. You know, th there's all these questions about the public health. I mean, how are they, who, who chooses how the investments are made? Why are grassroots not organizations not, you know, c called in to, uh, you know, make these, help these uh, movements happen by saying, look, I mean, I myself, we, we support 4,200 families families in Bradford alone, where, where are the public bodies? And I'm not just pinpointing local authority, there is so much going on. And I, you know, I'm a huge Bradvocate, don't get me wrong. But you know, there are questions to be asked, where's this investment going? How's it being spent? The problem is public bodies, Philippa, for all too long, they fund those people that they like. They do not find uh, fund the people that do not do like them. And that's the difference. As if you go against a grain and do something different, that may still work. But if they don't like you and you don't do like them, you won't get that fund. And as a tiny again organization, we won't get a look into that. We have to work twice as hard. Someone like me, not only because of my visual appearance, I, do I have to work twice as hard, but to try and get through those loopholes as a VCS organization too. So there's a much, much bigger picture, which is of no concern to the grassroots communities that we're trying to you know, upscale and, and, and help and support and save lives of. But in the background, it's a hamster wheel because we're, the investment is not going to the return. Do you think some of that might change because the recognition that yes vaccine uptake generally is amazing i mean we've never had such a successful vaccine uh, program uh, as the covid one but when you start to drill down you have communities you have impoverished areas you, you know and and the reasons in every community will be different culturally different or socially different so do you think that maybe funding bodies public bodies who are having to rely on organizations like yourself might be a little bit more open to that I, funding and empowerment in the future. Would that be maybe a positive to come out of all of this? It would be a huge positive and I can only hope um, that that is the case. Um, you know, we have been in conversation with Nadim Zahawi and his office ever since we presented that policy paper. But again, those protocols and those policies and that time to get a response. I mean, when is that response going to come? You know, at what, what point are, are we going to be, you know, called in to say, right, this work is great. Let's roll it out on mass to help further communities in different parts. Uh, how long 
long does that process take? Are we on a conveyor belt behind loads of others that may not be working? And I think certainly what, what this is it should have taught, um, you know, the, the big bodies sitting in ivory towers is that they need more connect with us directly. I think the rungs in between not only takes time, it takes lives. And that's what we've learned here. So we absolutely need to be looking at a, a closer microscopic version um, of how we have those direct conversations to say, hey, here's a program that works. Let's get it going. That's great. Uh, Imran, if I can come back to you, I've got a question about, you know, the kind of real, uh, if you like, anti-vaccine activists. And, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the internet is global. Um, therefore, the impact of anti-vaccine materials is now also in countries where the likelihood of your child dying from measles or polio or whatever is much higher. So this kind of material, whether it's in wealthy countries or poorer countries, is costing lives. So do you think that the, there should actually be the ability to bring criminal charges? Do you think there will ever be the ability to pin these people down. And, and just a question of mine, in, in the film, obviously there was a lot of discussion about the UK and the US, Wakefield driven out of the UK and yet, you know, treated like a, you know, a TV evangelist in America. Do you think there's a big, it, that's a big cultural difference between the UK and the US? So, and if I might observe the cultural difference first, I and mean, so, the, the, you are absolutely right. The COVID vaccine in the UK has been probably the most successful deployment in the world. And it's the most successful vaccine deployment in British history. So in reality, we're talking about a problem that is that that, that is very different to the problem that we see elsewhere in the world. And there has been specific communities in which misinformation has taken hold and which there's been greater uh, scepticism of the vaccine. But um, that that has been it's been held back. So what's held it back? First of all, strong institutions. And I, I mean strong institutions in terms of trust. So this misinformation's key role is to undermine people's trust in the authorities that normally transmit good information. And that's their key thing. If they can, if they can replace the NHS with themselves as the as the sort of the, the transmitter of good information, well, then they can sell you anything. They can sell you books, they can sell you false cures, they can sell you, you know, consulting on wellness. Uh, that's I and mean, that's how they make their money. And the UK's had these incredibly strong institutions, the NHS, which is an epistemic authority, the BBC, uh, primary care physicians, the relationship between PCPs and, the, and the, the public has been absolutely invaluable in inoculating people and giving them a locus of good information. But organizations like Noreen, because what we observed in, the, in, in, in our work is that the anti-vaxxers understand that they have to find them the places and spaces where people express anxiety and turn them into answering spaces. So to give them the wrong information, to drive them through to their information ecosystem. Now, the, 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 that I think is something we should be very proud of in Britain. I think we, we have done well compared to, say, the US, where, let's forget Donald Trump, it has just been a chaotic deployment. And there isn't the level of trust that people have in primary care physicians. As I've discovered uh, living here, you know, this is very much a second opinion country and the second opinion better marry up with what I want it to be, or I'm not going to listen to your opinion either. Um, so uh, we've, th there has been a greater problem here. The, the funny thing is both the US and UK have also gone at different rates when it comes to pu public authorities acting on it. So the UK early on recognized the, the national biosecurity threat, the national security threat from vaccine misinformation and has, as has been sort of come out every now and then, put serious resource into, into looking at how vaccine misinformation is spreading. The US is coming to that conclusion. So in, in discussions I've had over the past few weeks, the point I've made to people from Homeland Security and from other, um, other, other defense establishments in the US is more people will die as a result of anti-vaxxers than will die as a result of AQ or ISIS in the next year in the US. So which one do you want to, you know, do you want to really, really have zero effort on, on anti-vaxxers and 100% on, on terrorist threats? Um, that is that is that is filtering through and i mean i would uh, i think that we have been incredibly unambitious in how we have thought about how to deal with the anti-vaxxers who have caused such a biosecurity threat in part that's because we haven't understood that a very small number of people are responsible but when we find them these are fraudsters 
These are spivs. These are liars. These are people breaking advertising rules. So we are now seeing more bodies, including the FTC in the US, the Federal Trade Commission and others taking action. The UK should have been taking action against these fraudsters a long time ago. But also, will we have the tools to hold the platforms to account? Because I mean, you know, one of my aphorisms is you can't change a Nazi, but you can persuade a platform to not do business with a Nazi. And why is it that we haven't yet given ourselves the tools in a moment of exigency like the COVID crisis or January the 6th to be able to say to those platforms, guys, seriously, for a second, can you just stop giving a megaphone to the worst people in our society? Because really, right now, the public good is in trying to make sure that that bad actors who will always swarm around problems and, and moments of crisis are not given that sucker. So I mean, will the, will the bill do that? I, I, I don't know yet. I, am, I, I have my doubts, um, but I also